Warships are the ultimate symbol of a nation's military might. These things are monstrous wonders of technology. Enormous vessels, crewed by thousands, bristling with massive guns and powerful aircraft, they can deliver terrifying destruction and turn the tide of history. The ship was built to win the war. Now, there was no other reason. From the beginning of the 20th century to the present day, these are the stories of classic warships. From dreadnoughts to Bismarck, to Japan's monster sea warrior, Yamato. The American super ships, Wisconsin, Lexington, and Enterprise. To today's cutting edge Royal Navy carriers. These are the world's greatest warships. September 11th, 2001. The aircraft carrier USS Enterprise is in the Arabian Gulf on her way home. Without warning, she is ordered to turn around and head to the coastal waters of Southwest Asia. The 9-11 terrorist attacks have shocked the world and prompted the American government to declare their war on terror. As part of that war, Enterprise's aircraft will fly hundreds of missions against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in the remote and distant mountains of Afghanistan. This is just the latest chapter in the story of Enterprise, a story that already stretches back some 40 years. But the story of the aircraft carrier goes back a lot further than that. So how did the aircraft carrier grow from humble beginnings to become the decisive weapon in the Second World War? The ultimate instrument of military and political strategy in the Cold War. And as we enter a new era, promised to rule the waves for decades to come. They are still today arguably the most complex, expensive pieces of design and engineering on the planet. Within a decade of the first manned flight in the earliest years of the 20th century, naval strategists were thinking about launching aircraft at sea, but direct military engagement was not their primary concern. Dave Morris is a historian of naval aviation. The whole reason, in many ways, for the Navy to become involved with aviation and aircraft and taking aircraft onto their ships is effectively extending the view over the horizon. And so reconnaissance is really where the whole of naval aviation begins. When the First World War broke out in 1914, the need to find ways to fully combine air and sea power intensified. So at the start of the First World War, it's in its infancy. Aircraft are incredibly basic. There is no means of actually launching an aircraft from the deck of a ship basic catapults, basic arrestor systems, uh, platforms for, uh, on the fronts of ships. All of it was uh, ad hoc experiments almost, flying by the seat of your pants, trying out something new for the very first time. It was Britain's Royal Navy that led this experimentation, and the reserve collection of the fleet air arm in Somerset houses one of the few remaining examples of an early attempt at launching aircraft at sea, the seaplane lighter. A seaplane lighter is a towed vessel. It's, it's not, it doesn't have an engine, it's not a powered craft, it's a towed vessel capable of transporting, in this case, an aircraft. This craft could be towed and extend the range of a seaplane before it could be launched to fly. Crucially, as the name suggests, the seaplane lighter was only launching seaplanes, not fighter aircraft. But in the early years of World War I, Britain desperately needed fighter aircraft at sea. Since 1915, dozens have been killed in raids on towns and cities along England's east coast. The raids were carried out by German Zeppelins, huge airships carrying up to two tons of bombs. An aircraft launch from land offered little defense. It would take a, uh, a stop with Camel typically 45 to 50 minutes to spiral up to the 16, 17,000 feet 
that the Zeppelin would be operating at and maybe only have five minutes at most on target before it would then have to return to its base, possibly gliding because it was out of fuel. Salvation lay in the seaplane lighter, but not before some serious trial and error. What if we put a wooden deck on top of this craft? What if we towed the whole contraption at 15 to 20 knots into a 15 to 20 knot sea breeze, get an equivalent cross deck wind speed of around 40 knots? Could they launch a camel from a towed lighter and then take a fighter plane to sea? Landing was a totally different problem to solve altogether. It could not land back onto the lighter. It was not safe enough and long enough in deck space to land. It would have to do a controlled crash into the sea alongside the lighter, and hopefully the pilot would get rescued. As pilots and sailors began to master the new technology, the seaplane lighter came into its own. Only nine days after the first successful experiment to see a, a sop with camel take off from a seaplane lighter towed at sea, took the whole contraption into the, into the center of the North Sea, waited on station, and then intercepted Zeppelin L-53 and successfully shot it down, shocking the German Zeppelin crews into realizing they could be intercepted by fighter planes far out to sea. The aircraft had proven it could be a viable sea-based weapon, and the British were keen to scale up the technology. How could they develop that into a full-size craft? How could they effectively take multiple aircraft wherever they needed to go around the world to deliver their aircraft, almost like taking their airfield wherever they needed it? And this was the key final piece of the puzzle. Launched in 1918, HMS Argus was a reconditioned commercial ship with a runway built on top of her hull she was a real game changer. HMS Argus was the world's first aircraft carrier. By that, I mean a ship that was capable of both launching aircraft from its flight deck and recovering them onto the same deck with a hangar under that deck in which they could be stored, fueled, armed, and sustained in operations for a considerable period. You have a lifting system to get aircraft up and down from a big hangar deck below, and you have um, an arresting system to stop the aircraft as they land on the deck. Argus could now take 20 aircraft anywhere it wanted, anywhere in the world. By the end of the war, the German fleet was spending nearly all its time in Schillig Roads, its main base. And the Admiralty came up with the idea of using aircraft from Argus to attack them in their harbor. They'd practiced operating from Argus. They were ready to go in early November 1918, but the armistice happened before they could carry out the attack. Argus may not have played a leading role in World War I, but the blueprint for the aircraft carrier we know today had been drawn. And in the next war, carriers will be at the heart of the action. As the world slid towards war in the 1930s, naval engineers were restricted by treaty in the size of battleship they could build. Allowances for aircraft carriers were far more generous. So there's a strong incentive to develop and build aircraft carriers. And what you see is half-built hulls of capital ships, mostly battle cruisers, are converted on the stocks into aircraft carriers. The next step was to move beyond just sticking a runway on top of an existing ship. HMS Ark Royal, completed in 1938, incorporated all the Admiralty's ideas on how aircraft should be operated at sea from the 20s and 30s. She was big, she was 800 feet long, she had stowage in her two hangars, one over the other, for 60 or slightly more aircraft. Art Royal is a pioneering warship for the British because she's the first full-size fleet carrier that they really build from the keel up. So she's, she's a, a world beater for the, the European theatre when she comes in. Art Royal's flight deck was nearly 250 metres long and sat a full 20 metres above the waves. 
Her command and control functions were housed in an island on the starboard side of the deck, a common feature of aircraft carriers to this day. But it was the interior of the Ark Royal which was truly revolutionary. Andrew Chung is curator of ship's plans at the National Maritime Museum. This is the general arrangement drawing for the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal, showing her as completed. Now, it's an indicator of just how complicated this ship was. One of the secrets to Ark Royal's very impressive aircraft capacity was this new enclosed double-storey hangar that her designers built into her. In terms of the height of the average person, that's effectively a four-storey hangar divided into two. It was the first time that a proper weatherproofed hangar of that size had been built into a British aircraft carrier. And unlike previous large carriers in the Royal Navy, this one was designed to optimize aircraft handling. So the lower hangar was given over entirely to aircraft maintenance, whereas the upper hangar was intended purely for rearming, refueling, and preparing planes for their next mission. So the Admiralty believed that with this arrangement, they could come to a very efficient turnaround in aircraft and avoid a situation that they'd experienced in older carriers where ground crew doing one thing with one aircraft would get in the way of ground crew doing something entirely different with another aircraft. The Ark Royal also included catapults to help launch planes from her decks and arrestor cables to slow them down when they returned. And she was about to be put to the test against the most fearsome battleship on the seas, the jewel in Hitler's naval crown the mighty Bismarck. A quarter of a kilometer long and crewed by over 2,000 men, Bismarck boasted fearsome firepower and speed. She terrorized Britain's vital Atlantic convoys. Something needed to be done. The hunting of the Bismarck uh, far out to sea demonstrates Again, just the importance of the Navy being able to take aircraft to sea. The Atlantic is absolutely vast, so trying to cover it all by sea is finding a needle in a haystack. It's still very difficult doing it from aircraft, but you suddenly start to increase the chances of finding your target. Bismarck had already sunk HMS Hood, the biggest battleship in the British fleet, when she was spotted on the 26th of May, 1941. Swordfish biplanes were launched from Art Royal in pursuit. The trusty swordfish was able to drop down to almost sea height, level out, and approach 60 feet above the waves and launch their torpedoes against the Bismarck. The damage they did to Bismarck was fatal. One of the torpedoes hit the rudder right aft and jammed it. So no matter what they tried to do with her engines, Bismarck could only turn in circles. The ship was intact, apart from her ability to head home. And so she could do nothing but wait for the big guns of the home fleet to come up at dawn on the next day. Although Bismarck was ultimately sunk by battleships, it was air power that had crippled her. Dr. Jan Witt is an expert in German naval strategy in the Second World War. To a certain extent, uh, you could call the Bismarck the essence of a battleship. But at the same time, she was a dinosaur. She was the best, almost the best you could achieve in, in battleship building. But in strategic and also in tactical terms, she was outdated because she falls victim to a new weapon. Ark Royal may well have changed the rules of engagement on the high seas, but the British aircraft carrier as an all-round package remained a work in progress and challenges remained. Principally, how to build planes best suited to this complex form of aviation. It is probably, I would say, the most challenging form of flying. So if you imagine um, just the three biggest challenges of trying to land on and take off from an aircraft carrier, the first thing is your runway is absolutely tiny. Secondly, your runway is moving up and down. 
So when you're trying to take off, you're moving up and down. When you're landing, it's moving up and down. So your aircraft have to be incredibly robust because when you land, you're going to slam down on that deck. Um, and the third point is that your runway moves. So when you take off and go on your mission and you come back, your runway isn't going to be where you left it. So all of those things make naval flying incredibly difficult. At the beginning of World War II, the Royal Navy is still using, in many ways, quite outdated aircraft. Uh, gladiator biplanes, swordfish, um, typical of the aircraft that would be on the Ark Royal. Uh, skewer dive bombers, uh, but still quite slow. Uh, the, the necessity for a fighter aircraft, purpose-built, uh, was very, very high. The solution to all these problems was a very British compromise. Let's take an already successful plane and adapt it for life on the ocean wave. What we have here is the Supermarine Seafire, uh, the modified, navalized version of, of the Spitfire aircraft, converted to go on ship's decks with folding wings. It can enable them to go into the hangar spaces below. Uh, that had takeoff catapult spools fitted to strengthen parts of the fuselage. It had a deck hook, a rester hook fitted to the tail of the aircraft. But there's still compromises. The pilot is still sat very low. The pilot is still sat quite a long way rearwards behind the engine, which gives bad visibility on approach to the ships for landing. The undercarriage is still woefully weak for an aircraft that has to punch down onto an aircraft carrier deck in all winds and weathers. So when it's flying, the Spitfire stroke Seafire was still a very, very capable fighter, but it still had many, many shortcomings as a deck landing aircraft. The Americans made no such compromises with the planes they would place on their carriers. In America, there was no Air Force, and fighters and strike aircraft were designed for the Navy, by the Navy, for naval use exclusively. This strategy will be brought to life in purpose-built carrier aircraft, such as the Hellcat and the Corsair. This was the, the best that money could buy at the time. This was taking a design from the drawing board and creating a carrier-borne aircraft with all of the things that that would benefit from and require. A very strong undercarriage, very strong wing, powerful engine, deck hook designed from the outset to be in the best position on the aircraft, landing on carrier decks in all winds and weathers, taking the rigors of thumping onto the decks and, and, and being pulled to a halt by the arrest of wires, higher, better visual position for the pilot. The impact of these purpose-built American planes was not lost on the British Navy High Command, who saw a solution to their problem. From 1941, the Americans came up with uh, what was called the Lend-Lease Act, where they lent us the aircraft for the duration of the war. And in the end, thousands of aircraft came to the Royal Navy in that way. This was an enormous step forward for aircraft for the Royal Navy at that time in the war. But it wasn't only the Royal Navy who were keen on maximizing the military potential of naval aviation. In late 1941, six Japanese carriers traveled three and a half thousand miles across the Pacific. In total, they launched 353 planes against the battleships of the US Pacific Fleet anchored at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Four battleships were sunk, four more were heavily damaged. Nearly two and a half thousand Americans died. Pearl Harbor showed for the first time that carriers had a strategic role as a striking force that could travel considerable distances, attack targets, and cause a lot of damage when they got there. But whilst Pearl Harbor was a stunning triumph for the Japanese, it would have unforeseen repercussions. Not only had the US Navy's own aircraft carriers escaped the attack, but America's response would herald the arrival of arguably the greatest carriers in history. After Pearl Harbor, there was no doubt that the capital ship of the Second World War was going to be the aircraft carrier and was no longer the battleship. The centerpiece here was the Essex-class carrier. These were very large ships, uh, 38 to 39,000 tons, full load displacement. They had capabilities uh, 
to receive a lot of punishment. They were very survivable because of that and also because of their large anti-aircraft battery. But most of all, they could carry a very large air group. In total, an astonishing 24 ships of this class were built. Each ship could carry up to 110 aircraft housed in 3,600 square meters of hangar space and were crewed by more than 2,500 men. They had a range of 28,500 kilometers, equivalent of traveling from Los Angeles to Tokyo three times. With a top speed of 33 knots, the Essex-class carriers dominated the world's biggest ever battlefield, the Pacific Ocean. The Essex-class aircraft carriers can fairly claim to be the finest aircraft carriers produced by any nation. They captured that balance of aircraft capacity, protection, um, both passive and active, and high speed better than any other carrier design that was produced. And as significantly, the United States was able to produce them in numbers. The Essex-class carrier program was one of the biggest industrial achievements of the war. Uh, 11 of them had been ordered by 1940. And in the end, uh, there were 24 of them completed before the war had ended. When you think of that in terms of shipbuilding, it's huge. The ships were built to win the war. Uh, there was no other reason. In 1941, Japanese airplanes had launched a devastating attack on the US fleet at Pearl Harbor. The US Navy was reeling from the attack, but it was about to take delivery of the most iconic aircraft carriers in history, the Essex class. The USS Lexington was one of the first Essex class carriers, launched in 1943. Kenneth Colstep was a gunner on board during his first deployments in the Pacific. They wanted to have two squadrons of aircraft on the ship rather than one for each division. That is fighter, dive bomber, and torpedo bomber. It's a very flexible type of strike force that you have. You can be going out after ships where you'd be using your torpedo bombers, and they typically would do a simultaneous attack where the torpedo bombers would come in from low altitude and the dive bombers would come in from high altitude. Thus, they're splitting the defensive guns of the enemy. He's got to handle both at the same time. This variety of aerial firepower was critical in overwhelming the Japanese fleet. And it gave Lexington and her fellow Essex-class carriers the starring role in the US advance towards Japan. In 1943, the Americans began an island hopping campaign in the Pacific on their way to Tokyo. And the centerpiece of this campaign was the Fast Carrier Task Force. The task force had aircraft carriers at its core. These would be surrounded by battleships and destroyers to keep the enemy at arm's length, allowing the carriers to launch aerial attacks. Lexington led Task Force 58. Its first major engagement was at Truck Lagoon, a Japanese carrier base in the Central Pacific. The Japanese get their first taste of what the Essex-class carriers can do when they raid Truck Lagoon in February 1944 in the very aptly named Operation uh, Hailstone. This Japanese bastion is effectively destroyed as a frontline base over the course of a series of raids. Most of its aircraft are destroyed either in the air or on the ground. Any shipping are lucky enough to be caught in the lagoon is sunk and the Japanese never use truck again. They can't, it, it, they, they've had notice served to them that their premier Central Pacific bastion is no longer an option. The Americans called it the big blue blanket, which was the air cover they gave to the amphibious operations that captured the islands, that moved west across the Pacific to the very shores of Japan. They could stay at sea for weeks, even months on end, because they had logistics support groups with oil tankers, ammunition ships, stores ships, 
They could even provide replacement aircraft and pilots. It's one of the most powerful expressions of naval power in the pre-nuclear era. Four months after flattening Chuck Lagoon, Lexington joined 14 other US carriers in the Philippine Sea for what will become the decisive engagement of the war in the Pacific. This was the largest aircraft carrier battle of the Pacific War. We brought 15 aircraft carriers to the battle and the Japanese brought nine. And there's no other battle that uh, had that many aircraft carriers in it. They hurl this force at the new US carrier fleet in the, in the hope that they can turn the tables on the US Navy. And it's a complete disaster. The US remembers it as the great Mariana's turkey shoot, where um, dozens of Japanese planes are lost for each American pilot shot down. The battle effectively ends the Japanese carrier fleet for good. And it means that in the later battles, the Americans confidently come up with this huge aerial superiority which the Japanese simply cannot match. Since victory at Pearl Harbor in 1941, Japan's Navy had been outmaneuvered and outfought by the US Navy. The war was slipping away. The Japanese employed a final desperate tactic to knock out US carriers, the kamikaze attack. Planes packed with explosives and carrying only enough fuel for their outward journey would be flown directly into enemy targets in suicide attacks, designed to cause maximum damage. Lexington's defense was her Beaufort's anti-aircraft guns. Let's take out downtown. This is the largest machine gun produced in the world. It was made in Sweden, utilized by almost every country in the world, and it fires 120 rounds a minute. And what's unique about the gun is you had a trainer who sat on this side and a pointer over there who actually fired the gun. As the gun is training, uh, each operator, the pointer and the trainer, would uh, have to coordinate to bring the gun into position. As he's coming around, it was a pointer's responsibility the man on the left side of the gun to actually fire it. When he was in position, he would push his treadle with his left foot and the gun would fire. Once the kamikaze threat was uh, acknowledged and everyone knew that these people were out to kill him, uh, the gunners had to stay on their toes. Not only were they defending the ship, but they were defending their home. To this day, a Japanese flag marks the spot where a kamikaze pilot crashed into the Lexington, having avoided the hail of bullets from the Beaufort's machine guns. Kenneth Kohlstedt was on board that day. The Lexington was off the Philippines when two kamikazes dropped out of the clouds, going from left to right across the bow of the ship. Our radars had picked up the contacts as they were coming in, but our defensive patrol was unable to find them. They probably saw the ship at the same time that the ship saw them. And the ship started turning right to keep the guns focused on them. We got the first one, but the second one kept boring on in, and he was coming down from about 5,000 feet. Uh, he got hit several times, but uh, he just kept on coming in. The gasoline on the aircraft spilled over the crew, which were out in the open, and incinerated all of them, which was really horrible. As a result, we lost 48 people, and 132 were wounded. The pilot had obviously intended to hit the flight deck and make a large hole in the flight deck, which would have put Lexington out of service. But he hit this area instead. So in spite of the, the horror of the deaths and the wounded that, were, that happened, he did not seriously damage the ship. This pilot who was flying the aircraft that crashed into the Lexington was probably one of the original kamikaze pilots that had been selected. 
Amazingly, the whole incident was captured in a series of extraordinary photographs. This photo album uh, was made by a sailor on board this ship in, uh, in 1944. He was a photographer on board, and his name was Daniel John Connolly. He took all the original photos of the kamikaze strike on 5 November 1944. And during the attack, he was standing approximately right here. And he received a bronze star for photographing the aircraft coming straight in at him. And there was at some point that he said, well, I got to get out of here. Not even a direct hit from a kamikaze pilot could slow down the mighty Lexington. By the end of the war, Lexington had shot down 372 enemy aircraft and destroyed a further 475 on the ground. She had sunk over 300,000 tons of shipping, and not one Essex-class carrier was sunk during the war. Well, without the Essex-class carriers, it's difficult to say what alternate history would have been, but we definitely would not have had the striking power that we had during the Second World War. When the Second World War finally ended in 1945, the victorious Allies would redraw the map of Europe and in turn usher in the Cold War. The Cold War was played out not against one opponent, although obviously the Soviet Union was behind everything that was going on in the communist world, but sometimes you had to fight their surrogates, North Korea, North Vietnam and other countries. Carriers were invaluable in that they could provide power, a pulse of power bigger than most air forces, in order to cover the big blue blanket again, if you like, wherever Western foreign policy dictated. And the aircraft carrier that was built to meet this new challenge was something special. This is the Big E, the Enterprise, the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier the largest ship in the world. Enterprise was a giant in every sense. She was longer than four jumbo jets laid end to end. Her four and a half acres of deck space was the equivalent of three football pitches. She could accommodate 90 aircraft and house a crew of nearly 6,000. Enterprise was powered by eight nuclear reactors which gave her an unlimited range. In her 51-year service, Enterprise covered nearly 2 million kilometers, projecting US power to every corner of the globe. The USS Enterprise impresses me from her sheer scale. At the time she was completed in 1961, the US Navy pointed out that she's the largest mobile object ever built by man. Dave Zilber was a damage control officer on board Enterprise. He remembers well long stretches at sea. Because it was nuclear power, there was nothing to stop it from continuing underway. It's just getting food and stores for the crew. You know, so even if you loaded it all out just for the crew, you could just keep going for years and years as long as you could keep bringing on more stores. You knew that something special was happening when they throw out steaks and lobster tail. Not always a good announcement was coming. It's like, okay, guys, now we're gonna stay out underway for another two weeks. We're not getting that port visit, but we're gonna give you steak and lobster for dinner. With a ship's company of nearly 6,000, the Enterprise was not so much a warship as a small city at sea. And like any city, keeping it going was a complex logistical operation. I was the public works department. There was an electrical officer, an auxiliaries officer, and we all worked for the chief engineer. And we all had divisions of people underneath us with a lot of experience. We had warrant officers. We had chief petty officers that ran the enlisted troops of various different backgrounds and experiences. More than any other ship before her, Enterprise had perfected the art of sea power. Its huge size and immense crew meant it could launch multiple deadly airstrikes against targets all over the world. Once each aircraft came down and was caught and then released off its tail hook, then they would move those aircraft off to their parking areas. So you had aircraft handlers, you had plane captains, you had the catapult officers and the catapult crew 
they're all out there on the deck. You had fuelers, you had ordnance men, you had everybody in different colored shirts and helmets designating what their job was. Some of them are in radio communication, some of them it's just all hand signals. And you've got the blast from the jets coming off. Before an aircraft would launch, they'd put up these jet blast deflectors behind them, and then they'd drop it so the next aircraft could come up on the catapult. It's a very hot, windy, dangerous place to be. One of the many aircraft Enterprise carried in her early days was the A-5 Vigilante bomber, which had a nuclear strike capability. The combination of unlimited range and the Vigilante's ability to deliver nuclear weapons made the USS Enterprise the most powerful piece of military hardware in the world. Carriers like the Enterprise, their greatest influence, uh, I believe, on the Cold War was to show the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact and Allied navies just what the United States could produce, and what the United States could produce in numbers with their carrier battle groups all over the globe. Although the US would switch to launching nuclear weapons from submarines rather than carriers, Enterprise has been at the sharp end of every major US military maneuver over the last 50 years. In 1961, when the USS Enterprise was brand new, she took part in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which nearly made the Cold War hot. She carried out a number of tours off North Vietnam uh, from 1966 to 1973. She operated in the Pacific, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic. Her aircraft took part in strikes against Libya, against Bosnia. Her aircraft took part in the no-fly zone coverage over Iraq in the early stages of conflict in the Persian Gulf. She didn't finally pay off as an operational warship until 2011. And with more than 51 years of service and 25 deployments, she has always answered the call to serve. It's a direct descendant of the sort of power that can be projected by the US Navy in World War II. And in the era of the Cold War, all it takes is for a US carrier battle group to appear on the horizon for the demands of the United States to be taken seriously. The lesson of the Enterprise was clear. Any nation considered a first-ranked military power needs an aircraft carrier capability. It was a lesson Britain, the country that had pioneered the use of air and sea power, had all but forgotten. But today, something truly extraordinary is being built at a Scottish shipyard, the Queen Elizabeth-class carriers. The Royal Navy had pioneered aircraft carrier technology. It had been the first to combine air and sea power in battle and it had developed the first recognizably modern aircraft carriers. But since the defining battles of World War II, it had been left behind by the US and other nations. The new British Queen Elizabeth class comprises two ships, Queen Elizabeth, which is carrying out her protracted sea trials at the moment, and her sister ship, Prince of Wales, that's due to go to sea in late 2019. They're the biggest warships ever built for the Royal Navy. At 919 feet long, they're 100 feet longer than Art Royal. They were built in Brasyth Dockyard, just north of Edinburgh. Three years ago, here in Rosyth, the naming of HMS Queen Elizabeth was a strategic awakening for the United Kingdom. The moment when we proved to the world and to ourselves that we still have what it takes to be a great maritime industrial nation. What they give Britain is a strategic reach that this country has not had since the older Ark Royal class carriers were decommissioned. The key feature of these ships is size. It future-proofs them because they're designed to last for 50 years. We don't know what aircraft will be around in 50 years' time. But we do know that the present generation will last quite a long way into that. But with size, you can cope with change. 
is, is, is as sophisticated as, as any aircraft carrier that you will find anywhere in the world. Everything about the modern aircraft carrier has taken everything we've learned in the previous hundred years is now cemented into one package. Everything about the new carrier's design is intended to improve on all that have gone before. The Prince of Wales and uh, Queen Elizabeth are very, very different. The most obvious part of this difference is the fact they have two islands. What they've done is, is taken those two traditional bits that you have to have in any aircraft carrier to make it work, the bit that controls the ship and the bit that controls the flying, and they've completely separated them out. So that makes them visually very distinctive, but it also means that there is much less confusion in the way they operate the ships. The islands will hold some of the most advanced military equipment ever installed, including a revolutionary radar system, which allows each ship to track 800 objects in a 200 kilometer radius. F-35B fighter jets will be the crucial component of the air capability. Four planes can be delivered from hangar to flight deck in just 60 seconds and the carriers do it all with a much smaller crew. An American carrier has a ship's company of roughly 4,000 men to operate an air group of about 70 aircraft. Queen Elizabeth, with the full air group embarked, is expected to have about 1,600 sailors on board, plus 250 marines if they're embarked, so considerably less. To do that, they use the sort of computer-controlled automation that supermarkets and Amazon would use. In other words, one man with a touch screen can control a robot to go and collect a bomb off a shelf in a magazine and bring it via a railway line to a bomb lift and then bring it up to the flight deck where armorers can take it, fuse it and put it on an aeroplane. We've never had anything with that degree of automation before and they've got it. The projection is that by the end of their working life, they won't even be operating manned aircraft. They'll all be drones. So I don't think we even really know what the full capability of these ships is going to be going forwards. The Queen Elizabeth class is designed to build on all the lessons of the aircraft carrier through history. To be fearsome enough to project power, but flexible enough to perform multiple tasks in peacetime too. They are very much multi-mission vehicles. So they can function as aircraft carriers, they can function as anti-submarine warfare ships, they can form the core of a battle fleet or act in conjunction with, say, a US carrier battle group. They can also take part in more peaceable activities, um, pacification, uh, uh, anti-piracy, and even disaster relief, which was the sort of thing that we have used our, our amphibious landing ships for in recent years. I think there's no better proof, really, that the, the carrier is still there as, as the apogee of naval power than the fact that the Britain's Royal Navy has invested vast sums in building two state-of-the-art carriers because there's nothing really to beat a carrier as a means of power projection. It's a piece of your own real estate that you can take anywhere in the world to deploy in support of land forces, to control the oceans, to protect trade. They're incredibly versatile assets. It's been over a hundred years since those early experiments at combining air and sea power in World War I. A hundred years in which aircraft carriers have featured in the iconic battles of World War II, policed the world during the Cold War, and remained center stage to the present day. They are still today, perhaps arguably the most complex expensive pieces of design and engineering that humans are putting together on the planet, even in an age of, of airliners and spacecraft. The captain of the 1970s, Art Royal, Captain Fell, once made, I think, a very good statement. He said, the role of my ship is to go anywhere at high speed and do anything the British government wants me to do when I arrive there. And think about that, that's precisely what they can do. And the Royal Navy's commitment to the Queen Elizabeth class carriers stands as testament to the enduring importance of these multifaceted fighting machines.
We're turning back the clock to when Europe's busiest airport was built and reveal some of its present day secrets in brand new Heathrow Airport then and now, Tuesday at 8. Next tonight, we're off to Milan for Fight Night on 5 Live Bellator with Melvin Manhoff taking on Yannick Bahati.